My name is Jonas Pensin. I am a researcher at the Berlin-based Institute for Ecological Economy Research and have the honor of uh, guiding you through the session, which I, I think is the, the last session before we do the final wrap-up of the conference and then we can move into the party part of the day. Um, I would like to extend a very warm welcome not only to all of you here but also to the people in the stream. I'm waving my hand here. Um, before we hear from our amazing guests who are down here with me, but also one person will join us up here. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce you to what we want to be speaking about here in the next um, 19 minutes. So what, what is it, what makes it necessary to speak about post-capitalism in the information age? So let me start with a, little, a couple of introductory words. Digital platforms have fundamentally reshaped our societies. Amazon has revolutionized the shopping experience, Twitter has become an essential tool of public deliberation and, allow me to make a kind of boomer joke, TikTok, I guess TikTok has learned us uh, manifold new ways of dancing. So, not only since the corona pandemic, but surely encouraged by it, we witness a stunning concentration of capital, data, and there was also power in the hand of few platform corporations. And, this has led a variety of scholars and public intellectuals to characterize this part, this era in which we're living as a form of platform capitalism. And if we want to understand platform capitalism, we must not only look towards the Silicon Valley and the GAFA companies, Google, Amazon, Meta, Apple, but we also need to look towards Shenzhen and uh, Tencent, Alibaba and Baidu. But this global domination of big tech is problematic for a variety of reasons, and I want to mention a couple of them now before we dive into the discussion. The first one is that we have to be clear what we are speaking about when we speak about big tech. The big tech platforms, they are not just simple market participants as any other. It's not that today I'm using Twitter and tomorrow I'm using something entirely different and they're just the same. No, what these platforms are is they are themselves markets. They own the infrastructures behind them, they own the market. And that allows them to single-handedly set the rules for how we, the users, interact on and through these infrastructures. And what is the result of this? The result are new dependencies towards these private corporations. And of course, there's also a stunning lack of accountability with these organizations. And a second problem that we see is that these big tech platforms more and more act and resemble um, a, a, a monopolies. Um, and from using the terminology from antitrust and competition law, they stifle true innovation and they limit consumer choice. And what is the result? The result is that non-commercial alternatives, and we've, we've spoken about a lot of them here in the past two days, OpenStreetMap or the platform cooperatives, they find it quite difficult to compete and they remain in the niche. So let me put it bluntly. This is not how we envisioned the socio-ecological transformation of the digital economy to unfold. And that leads us to this famous question that Lenin raised in the early 20th century, well, what is to be done? Politicians have largely answered this question in recent years by turning towards competition law. And with the Digital Markets Act, the European Union, for example, has made a first attempt to impose um, obligations on the most powerful, what they call the gatekeeper platforms. And the stated aim is they want to enable fairer competition. But, but can competition policy really solve the issues that we see in, uh, um, in platform capitalism? Or do we need to go further? Do we need to aim for a more radical restructuration of digital markets? This is the backdrop against which we meet here today. And together with my panelists, we want to discuss what policies do we need to break market power? How can we ensure that our digital futures are centered around the common good and not profit? And what could post-capitalism in the information age look like? I am more than, more than lucky that I have three experts with me who can, who can answer these questions. And uh, I would like to introduce them uh, one after another and then they will come to the stage. They will each give a, give a brief input and afterwards we will all sit down here and um, talk a little bit and then we will open the floor to also have questions from all of you. So, uh, the first person I would like to welcome to the stage is uh, Cecilia Ricap. Cecilia is down here. Uh, wait one second, I will, I will say some kind words about you and then, then you can come up. Uh, Cecilia holds a PhD in economics from the Universidad de Buenos Aires and uh, she works as a permanent lecturer in international political economy at City University of London. Her research focuses on the political economy of science and technology. And currently, she investigates the rising concentration of intangible assets, which she claims is behind the emergence of what she calls intellectual monopoly capitalism. 
Cecilia has edited and published two stunning books on these topics. The first one is called Capitalism, Power and Innovation, Intellectual Monop Monopoly Capitalism Uncovered. And the second one is called The Digital Innovation Race, Conceptualizing the Emerging New World Order. And we are more than happy to have you here today. Cecilia, welcome to the stage. Hi. OK, this works. Hi, everyone. So at some point, you will be able to see my slides. But in the meantime, uh, let me say, you see them already, that I'm very happy to be here. And I'm particularly looking forward to discussing with all of you. So I will go briefly into what is just an introduction to the framework that I've been developing with other colleagues to try to understand not only big tech companies, but also what is driving economic power in contemporary capitalism. So to give you just some stylized facts that I will not cover in detail, as you can briefly see on the slide, the largest companies, the companies with the highest market capitalization, are not only concentrating more and more value, but also have in common that they are intensive in intangible and in particular in digital assets. And this has led me, together as I was saying with other colleagues, to start thinking of them as intellectual monopolies. So what, what do we mean when we think of these companies as intellectual monopolies? The first thing is that these are not just one-time innovators, and I will be uh, start, like, arguing a lot of things that might be in contradiction to the established notion, because as Jonas was just saying, these companies are usually accused of stifling innovation. And what I claim is that Actually, they are appropriating innovation, which is different. They do innovate, but they do not do it alone. And they are constantly turning more knowledge and data into intangible assets. But that knowledge and data that they turn into intangible assets is not mostly, not mainly developed by these companies themselves, but actually by a whole set of other organizations, universities, public research organizations, and also startup companies. They participate in the process of producing knowledge. They participate in innovation as a process, so in the innovation process, but they do not harvest the profit, the economic profit associated with the innovation process. Of course, I know you cannot see this in detail, but it's just a way in which in my research, and I can share with you the PDFs of my books if you're interested in them, or my publications, basically what I try to do is to map the co-authorships of these companies. So these companies, big tech among them, but also big pharma companies and other leading corporations publish papers, just like us when we are doing research. And when they uh, sign their affiliations, they are also co-authoring these papers with many other organizations. And this is a way to show, to prove that this knowledge is being developed with many other organizations. And when you compare this with patents, for instance, where these companies are almost exclusively owning the patents, so they do not share the, own, the co ownership, it's quite clear that there is a predatory practice. But when I think of these companies, I'm not only thinking of these companies in terms of patent monopolies, because there is a lot of knowledge that is kept secret. And think, for instance, of big data, but also think of the algorithms, the search engine algorithm from Google or Amazon. So this is, goes way beyond concentrating intellectual property rights. And another thing is that they have managed to turn the privilege of the innovator from a temporary into a permanent advantage, because they are constantly turning new intangible assets uh, new knowledge into intangible assets, which means that they are active rentiers. They cannot just sit and rely on their intellectual rents. They need to be constantly turning more knowledge into intangible assets. And you can already think of big tech and why they are so special, but I will cover that in a second. Before that, let me say, this is not the same as claiming that these companies are market monopolies. It's different. What they have is exclusive access to portions of knowledge. Of course, this contributes to concentrating more market power, but not automatically leads to have one company in one market. And this makes things more complicated because regulations are usually focused on markets and miss the production sphere and miss the innovation sphere and the power relations that take place in that process. If you want to understand the emergence of all this, and actually I will not have time to develop this, but just for you to have a quick snapshot, 
Why now? Why do we see all these companies now emerging? And I'm not only speaking of big tech, I mentioned big pharma, you can think here in Europe of Siemens, you can think of automobile industry companies like Toyota or Volkswagen, you can think of Coca-Cola, Nestlé. All these companies actually have been favored by all these things. First, how knowledge is produced. And we produce knowledge on the basis of existing knowledge, and those that are at the knowledge frontier are better prepared to absorb new knowledge and turn that knowledge into innovations in their production process. So those that are already leading will have higher chances to be always leading in the future. But that this could have happened at any point in time, and this is why it's also important to consider all the other things. Among them, a very important part is the, are the institutional and political transformations. But as I was saying, I don't have the time to develop this, but if you're interested, I can uh, unfold each of these bullet points in the Q&A. But just to say that this is a process, a historical one, that on the one hand relies on the specificities on how we produce knowledge, but at the same time also depends on the role of the states, also relies on certain technological developments that have contributed to concentrate knowledge in fewer hands. And when we think of big tech, so now I'm switching to focus specifically on big tech, when we think of big tech companies, what is the knowledge that they are appropriating and turning into intangible assets? So we can look at the content of these company scientific publications by doing text mining of uh, and, and see what are the most often key, keywords or multi-terms that appear in the text of their publications. And what you can see in green are uh, terms that refer directly to a specific technique within AI, which is machine learning, and within it to deep learning or deep neural networks. And you can also see in blue a lot of keywords referring to data. And the yellow ones are the functional applications of artificial intelligence. And why this is important? Because this leads us directly to why are digital platforms so central to this stage of capitalism? And this, in part, is explained by the, by the way the technology works. Big data is processed with these machine learning algorithms, deep learning and neural network algorithms, that get better the more they are used which means that they are like means of production that instead of depreciating their value when we use them, they get better and better. So the more data these companies harvest from all of us, the better their algorithms get, the better predictions, the better the digital intelligence they get. So it's a constant process of innovation that accelerates way more than what happens, for instance, with Big Pharma or with the automobile industry leaders or with Nestle or Coca-Cola who concentrate other types of intangible assets. And this is also why these companies, as data-driven intellectual monopolies, so companies that part of what they concentrate is data, but also the algorithms that process this data, why these companies are even capable of performing a form of planning that is kind of different from what we were used to. And this is Jack Ma, so he's the CEO founder of Alibaba, precisely claiming that with all this data, they can plan in economies completely, not just, um, and, and in a more accurate way than it has never been seen. And actually, they are using it to plan greater portion, portions of the world, because these companies are expanding and perpetuating their data-driven intellectual monopolies by two means. One is that they are entering new industries, and be, of course, because of the focus of this conference, I highlighted energy systems. Because Amazon, for instance, is concentrating a lot of intangible assets associated with having the skills and the capacity to capture energy systems related data and analyze that data and providing services through its cloud, but not only to actually concentrate all the energy systems and make them the most efficient. So for companies that are producing renewable energies, it's kind of efficient and good and cost saving to operate through Amazon Web Services. But at the same time, it's perpetuating and reinforcing these companies' intellectual monopolies. So it's a quite complicated scenario. And this is related also to the way the cloud works. All the companies that operate through the cloud and use software as a service, in particular artificial intelligence as a service, get access to a black box. They cannot see the technology. The users of the technology cannot learn from using. This process of learning by doing, learning by interactive, these other ways of learning that are not just science-based, but picking up 
what's already been developed and try to do this sort of reverse engineering to understand what's going on, that is completely curtailed because the only thing that you can do is use the services, but not really access the technology. And this is the concentration of this market where only three companies, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, has around, have around 65% of the market, and the fourth one is Alibaba, mostly operating in China. But all this is not just in contradiction with state's power. These companies become more and more powerful, but this, surprisingly as it may seem, is not only a process of struggling against states, but also a co-evolution between corporate and political powers, in particular with the US and the Chinese state. Big tech cannot exist without the policies that were put in place by their own states, without appropriating in particular knowledge from the US and China respectively. But also, at the same time, the US and the Chinese state are the most powerful states in the world, among others, because they have these companies as their ambassadors nowadays. And they rely on them for their everyday activities, going from the transformation or modernization of the statistics agencies to operate uh, their clouds. But at the same time, these companies are policy makers, and they work as policy makers in two different realms. One, they directly advise their own states on what to do. For instance, CEOs and, and high management of big tech companies from the US provide suggestions to the US Secretary of Defense on how to invest and what to invest on when it when in relation to AI. And the advice is invest more and more and more because China is the threat. And we are the savers because we are defending the US in front of Chinese uh, threat. But at the same time, they, plan, they have like kind of a juxtaposition of uh, policy realms because these companies, and you have here Mark Zuckerberg saying it, these companies are constantly defining rules, standards, what can be done and what cannot be done in their digital, digital republics. So overall, we should ask, are we still governed by rules or by algorithms and how is this being shaped? So what is to be done very briefly? This is very complicated because it's clear that the typical policies don't work in this scenario. Just investing more in science and technology, at the same time, the more public research we produce, the more we are feeding these intellectual monopolies. If we try also to break markets and to use the typical antitrust policies, this will not work either for many reasons, among other because these companies operate what we can call this natural monopolies from, from the uh, economic theory point of view. Think of the efficiencies you get if you only have one search engine instead of having 10 search engines. Not only your individual efficiency because you will lose less time, but also because the algorithm gets better if it channels all the searches instead of only one tenth or, or so of the searches. So, we could argue that we need a new common knowledge regime, and I'm totally convinced of that, and to that we need everyone to be capable of using and mobilizing that knowledge, so we also need public free education for all and a whole set of other transformations at the global level, but that's quite far from happening. And although we can have it as a long-term goal, we still need to think of short-term solutions, and this is why I mentioned some feasible things over there. But just really to conclude, another thing that we need to discuss and, and foster and push is for different forms of taxing. These companies need to pay more taxes. If they are not dismantled, if they are not really challenged, at least we need to claim back part of what they are appropriating. And of course, as a long-term way of solution or thinking of how to tackle uh, the, the contemporary challenge, challenges, if these companies, which are the most powerful in the world, are planning spheres of production, are planning beyond their legally owned capital, and are capable of organizing production processes using not only markets, but actually planning quite a lot of of innovation, production, and so on, why not us thinking again in terms of planning, but planning really for the people and for tackling the most pressing issues in the world. So with this, uh, thank you a lot, and I'm looking forward to discussing with you. <laughs> Shall I go down? Thank you so much, Cecilia. This was uh, a lot of material that we can work with in the discussion. I'm looking forward to, to diving deeper into some of the things that you have mentioned. Um, the second person I want to introduce now can sadly not be here with us in person today, but we have him, hopefully, online. I'm looking towards the team up there. Um, I will introduce him now. Um, he, will be, he will be there. 
Perfect. Okay. Um, the next question is uh, Max Max Bank. Uh, he's joining us online from Cologne, and uh, Max is a campaigner at the Lobby Control Initiative, which aims to educate the public about lobbying and power structures in Germany and the European Union. And just like lobby control, Max himself is committed to the notions of transparency, democratic control, and aims at creating clear barriers to influence politics and the public. Over the past years, Max has addressed these issues um, both as a, as a researcher, and he has a uh, PhD from the University of Cologne in economics, and also as an activist for Attack Germany. Uh, today, in his position at Lobby Control, Max's primary focus is on the increasing power of big tech and how these corporations try to lobby at the European level. So it's absolutely great to have you, Max, and there you are behind me. I'll give you the floor, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much, Jonas, for the introduction. I hope can, everybody can hear me now. Is that is the sound okay? Can someone say yes? Uh, no resonance from from the from the audience. Can you hear me well? Uh, I might as well start. So uh, thanks for enabling me to join from from Cologne. Uh, my my uh, family got COVID, so uh, I was not able to join in person. Uh, I would start with a disclaimer, saying that I'm only uh, an expert on lobbying in the EU, which is sort of interesting to, to the topic we're discussing today, but uh, I just want to highlight that I don't know much about what's going on in terms of lobbying in the US, for instance, uh, which might be interesting actually to know when we discuss big tech. But I want to say basically six points on the lobby power of big tech that I experienced in the last couple of years in my research and campaign. First point, big tech lobby power is immense. The digital industry in Europe spends more than 97 million uh, euros a year. Um, and big tech, so let's say the largest uh, tech companies, the 10 largest tech companies, are responsible for, for a third of this lobby spending. More than 140 lobbyists uh, for to, uh, lobby on behalf of the top, top 10 digital platforms in the EU, spending more than 30 millions. This has been enormously increasing by two thirds in the last uh, decade. So um, this also shows that Big tech reacts to increasing regulation in the EU. They are by far the biggest lobby spender in the EU, outspending the top 10 uh, car industry, car makers, outspending the top 10 chemical, uh, chemical companies, outspending even the financial industry. Point one. So, point two. Big tech is also faced with a lot of challenges. It's relatively new, it's not EU-based, and <laughs> it has had a lot of scandals. What does that mean for companies coming primarily, at least the, the really big ones, uh, from, from the US and China? They have no close ties to member states' governments, like, for instance, the German car industry has. So they need to spend more. They need to do more on public relations. It's also important for them. Uh, yeah, it's important for them to take care of their image, right? So the data scandals, they have worsened Meta's image in the last couple of years. Amazon has been criticized for working conditions in its logistics centers. So very important for big tech lobbying is, is their image campaigns. Meta, for instance, has spent 6 million euros on on image campaigns uh, in 2020 alone in Germany. Um, what they also do is big tech companies uh, collaborate with think tanks to polish up their image uh, towards policymakers in particular in Brussels. So in the Brussels bubbles, think tanks play a big role, but uh, their, their relations uh, to big tech are especially important nowadays. Uh, sometimes they are very transparent, sometimes they are quite intransparent. Um, all in all, that's uh, quite a problematic field because uh, they, they, in a way, think tanks uh, polish up the image of big tech. 
And that's interesting uh, with respect to what Cecilia was saying. Um, big tech tries to create the image that they are super innovative. And that's why they, they fund uh, fake SME alliances in Brussels. Uh, two of them I mentioned, SME Connect and Allied for Startups, which have been very much involved in the policy discussions around the Digital Services and the Digital Markets Act. Big point three. Big tech, what does big tech really want? They are in their lobbying, their main stance is to be anti-regulatory. There are, of course, differences between the big five, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Alibaba, and, and uh, Huawei, whoever. Uh, but generally, the aim is anti-regulatory. They, they grew up uh, in, in, in an anti-regulatory environment. In, in digitalization was not very much regulated in, in the beginning. Now it's increasingly being regulated, and uh, they're trying to counteract that with powerful narratives, by the way. One is, of course, the, the, the warning of China, that Chinese companies might take over and do all the innovation, and uh, that's, that's one narrative. The other one is, uh, we are irreplaceable when it comes to solving problems. We provide the services when we want to uh, yeah, overcome the COVID crisis, for instance. So these narratives are very powerful, but uh, um, you have to disclose them. Point four. Poly policymakers in the EU are willing to regulate. Generally, uh, we have the impression that citizens in the EU don't feel comfortable with the power of big tech. This in includes policymakers across the political spectrums, including the conservatives. Andreas Schwab, the rapporteur for the Digital Markets Act, for instance, is a German conservative, and we think it's fair to say that he's been quite ambitious with the Parliament's position regulating, regulating digital markets. So there's a sort of skepticism towards big tech among many politicians, sometimes only due to the fact that most of the digital platforms don't come from the EU, but from Silicon Valley in China. At the same time, politicians from member states or even member state governments in the EU that host big tech companies such as Ireland, Meta and Apple, always try to weaken new regulations for big tech. We saw that uh, a lot during the Digital Market Act discussions, but uh, luckily uh, Ireland is not such a powerful member state. In the EU. So there's a certain will to regulate. Point five, big tech needs allies when it wants to be successful in influence, e influencing EU policymaking. Let me compare the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act. I think it's uh, fair to say that the DMA, Digital Markets Act, has, uh, is, uh, has been quite successful in, in creating new re uh, rules for, de uh, for gatekeepers, uh, for big tech. They have to... Um, they really have to open up um, in, in parts. Uh, we can go into more details about that. The DMA really is, in our view, a success if it is properly enforced, and that's a key question. At the same time, the Digital Service Act is a good example where, where big tech had its say, and this was especially due because they could work together with uh, the publisher's lobby. So Springer and Google worked together on this and made sure that targeted advertising, which is at the heart of the Digital Services Act, is and at the heart of uh, some of the business models of big tech, uh, is not prohibited entirely and only weakly regulated via the Digital Services Act. So I would say big tech needs EU allies to be successful in its lobby aspirations. Six and last point, there is a window of opportunity to regulate digitalization, to regulate big tech, and to really challenge the power of big tech by uh, means of structural remedies. What is clear from our, from, our, from our perspective as a lobby watchdog organization is that big tech is simply too powerful, has too much lobby power, 
It has too much market power, and lobby power and market power are two sides of the same coin. There's a lot of research showing that market concentration and lobby power go hand in hand. We have research for the US on that, and we will see more research on the EU side. Uh, that is why we argue only if we challenge this dimension of accumulated private power, and I say private power, which is not democratically controlled, we will reduce big tech's threat to democracy. Of course, we need better uh, political institutions with stronger lobby regulation, especially tackling a one-sided lobbying. But we also need to go uh, uh, and challenge uh, the accumulation of power. We would argue that uh, we need the break up, uh, break up of big tech, and that this is a necessary step, a step to to ensure democratic control. Uh, we 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 think with an openness by uh, policymakers across the political spectrum to discuss uh, the power of big tech. We have opened a debate about power concentration in the economy. We want to go beyond, because this is not a, only a problem of big tech, classically, but, but it goes beyond that. We have big pharma, we have uh, the automobile industry. But um, our idea is that discussing uh, power concentration in the economy and as a result in our society is key to finally contribute to a democratic digitalization and potentially actually to, post, uh, to, to a post-capitalist digital society. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Max. We will uh, see you again um, in 10, 15 minutes for the, for the panel discussion. Looking forward to diving deeper into these questions. Um, now, last but most definitely not least, we have our, our third panelist here who I would like to introduce. And um, the third person here is uh, Ela. Ela Kagel is a digital strategist and managing director of uh, Supermarkt Berlin, which is a platform for digital culture and alternative economy in Berlin. Since 2019, she also serves on the board of Platform Cooperatives, which is a, a cooperatively structured uh, organization, a cooperative that supports decentralized, cooperatively structured companies with a dis uh, digital business model. Just this year, in 2022, Ela has also started the Game Changer project, which deals with the change framework conditions of cultural institution in a network world. At the center of ELA's work is the effort to promote a cooperative digital economy as an alternative to the monopolies of platform capitalism. So thank you so much for joining us, ELA. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jonas and um, Cecilia and also Max, uh, who spoke before me. So when we just heard from Max about big tech, I will certainly argue from a position of small tech, right? Or low tech, um, because the work I'm doing is mostly uh, grouped around the field of platform cooperativism, as Jonas just said. Uh, that means um, I'm really interested in getting a better understanding of what is needed to help growing real alternatives because uh, what we just heard is quite depressing news. And uh, I believe every word of it is true. But at the same time, I also think, looking at the current stage of capitalism, uh, capitalism itself is not just a, an economic phenomena, but it's also a mindset. Uh, and it is also an indicator for a certain crisis of imagination we find ourselves in, because, I mean, looking at the reality, looking at the figures we just heard from Cecilia and from Max, who of you would argue, okay, let's just gain our powers and, you know, let's just, let's try to do something against it. I strongly believe it is possible to create uh, alternatives, but it's not possible to do this in a standalone manner, meaning, um, yeah, within the certain uh, entrepreneurial framework where an organization tries by itself to conquer any of these monopolies. This is, of course, 
it's not realistic, and I think we, we, we will all agree on that. So what I would like to propose is a set of things that after years of working with uh, alternative uh, economies, with working especially with platform co-ops, which are basically also here in Berlin, which we have plenty of them. Um, and I just want to share that with you. So I think, first of all, it's really about the, this crisis of, of, of imagination that we have to consider the way we tell the stories about the current state of the economy, not only among ourselves, but also to our children, to the people we meet, because this is certainly about learning to envision that another world is possible. If we give up on that, we can switch off the light and go, go home right away. So from the perspective of these alternatives, uh, and let's call them platform co-ops, but of course it can also be purpose organizations, uh, it could be uh, other forms of organizing, maybe potentially even DAOs. Uh, what is needed? So I think what's super important to understand, if we look at platform cooperatives such as Fairbnb, for instance, that set off their work as an alternative to Airbnb, or if we look at alternative drivers collectives, if we look at platform co-ops such as Resonate Streaming Music Collective, which basically does what you all know from Apple Music, but uh, in the form of a cooperative with both um, uh, musicians and fans on board co-owning the organization. What they need is infrastructural help because obviously they don't have any means to conquer the um, domination of those monopolies we just heard of. So what, what we basically need, and I think this is super important, we need structural support and we need to create a new understanding of stakeholders in the economy. because. We have all this traditional set in mind from the, yeah, the, the entrepreneurs, then there's the market, there's the retailers, etc., etc. But what if we would follow what Eleanor Ostrom has provided us with, uh, like really uh, a great framework of how to build commons-oriented economies, and for her, bringing the right stakeholders together is an essential tool. So. I don't know how many of you know Silke Helfrich, who has worked on an amazing set of literature and uh, also frameworks on commons-based economies um, in, her, in her book, Free, Fair and Alive. And also, after pub having published that book, she has uh, created models of um, public commons partnerships, meaning that if we want to have these alternative economies to succeed, we have to bring policymakers, municipalities into the game and not just relying on the entrepreneurial power of these organizations because they can't compete and we already talked about that. So by establishing these new partnerships, we also have to look at um, the fact, and this was discussed in the last two days very often, and people say, okay, but still it's a competitive market, so how, how would cooperatives find a way to work together? Uh, looking at the Cooperative Alliances Charter, intercooperation and cooperatives working together is an integral part of the value that are given there. So what about uh, coming up with uh, frameworks where intercooperation is rewarded and is incentivized so that those organizations really work with each other and work together instead of taking the services of one of these monopolies. And that would, of course, that would encourage little infrastructures to be built up. Uh, and this is something that we certainly miss at this point because most of, uh, of, these, uh, of these smaller organizations fail the power to really, uh, yeah, inter-cooperate because they are so busy with just staying alive. And that's also what leads to those silos. We also need new organizational frameworks, uh, no matter if it's cooperatives, but we also need frameworks for these organizations working together transnationally with all sorts of currencies, with stakeholders that can participate globally. 
And we don't have that because a lot of the legal frameworks, especially here in Germany, is really in need of reform. Uh, and that doesn't only go for cooperatives, but it also goes for other forms of organizations, which would allow various stakeholders to be included and value transfer uh, basically on a global level. And there's still a lot of work to be done here. And with that, I also want to stress that there's another aspect we still we have to look into, and that's the whole governance aspect. Because if we talk about platform co-ops, for instance, we talk about democratic control and collective decision-making. And at the heart of that is governance, is the protocol of taking decisions together, of yeah, finding ways to steering an organization in a decentralized manner. And this is also something where we need to encourage research and wisdom to be spread around, because this is not a given, and we all have not learned it in school or university. Um, yeah, I guess what I, what I said about the diverse group of stakeholders, we could see it when you uh, especially mentioned it, that a lot of the uh, representatives of big tech are consulting their own administrations. Uh, and this is due to the fact that we do not have any binding global rules for how stakeholder groups are being put together. I guess this is something that is going to be vital in order to really make sure that we do not just make policies for one single group. Um, we need to support the union, unionization of big corporations such as Amazon, which is another really interesting development we've seen over the past years, that all of a sudden these organizations are being challenged from within. Uh, so this is another thing we need to look at and put our support out, because I can believe a lot of transformation power also comes from that. And finally, what I can say is the time for action is right now. Uh, policies take a lot of time and very often there's a lot of talking and meeting behind the scenes. But if we look at where we currently at, it's really, uh, I think the call is coming up for actions networking right now. So that's it from my side. Thanks. You can, you can Maybe, maybe one in, in the second or the third, and then we can have Max on the screen and Cecilia. Yeah, yep. exactly. Great. Do you want a bottle of water? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, now we have a, um, a very easy task at hand, I think. Um, we want to collectively uh, figure out how we can move beyond capitalism. So um, I guess 20 minutes might be enough for that, and uh, then we have all the solutions. Um, maybe just to start off, Max, can you see and hear us? Perfect. You're ready for the task at hand? Great. Okay. So when I, when I heard these presentations, um, you on one of, one of your slides, Cecilia, you had um, in the bottom right part uh, the question of like, what are feasible, feasible things that we can do right now? And you didn't expand on it, but I think maybe, maybe we could start with that, you know, because um, maybe we could imagine if we would go out of this room tomorrow, today, and we, we would be powerful individuals and we could make big choices, what would be the number one, the very first choice that we would need to take in order to move us beyond capitalism in the information age. So we're kind of just like in very brief, what would be the number one thing that you would undertake in order to get us there? And maybe we start with you, Max, because the online is always most difficult to integrate, so, so let's kick it off with you. What would be the number one thing you would do tomorrow? You're still, okay. you're still on mute. Or we have muted you. Either way, we cannot hear you. So I'm looking towards the technical people. They're shaking their head, but that's no problem. We can, we can start with someone else. Um, Cecilia, yeah. maybe we start with you then. Sure. The number one thing, what would you do tomorrow? So I guess the question should be split between what can be done and what I would do. What I would do, I would expropriate big tech. I would not break them up. I would expropriate big tech, I will say it again. And use all the digital infrastructure they have and all the knowledge and all the data to put it at the service of alternatives that are decentralized. So I totally agree with what you were saying. That needs to be, if I understood you correctly, a combination of things. So the cloud still needs to be centralized because of a lot of technical efficiencies, because of uh, savings that will happen 
but at the same time, we can have a lot of local platforms, local solutions, tackling specific issues. So I think it needs to be a combination between global solutions, new institutions. When I say public, it's not one state. I think of a global institution and then local solutions. This could be a dream coming true that we will not see. So if we go to the feasible thing, I think that a very interesting example, although it doesn't come from, from the tech sector, but it's still illustrative, is the flu network. So how researchers, not for COVID, but for the pre-existing flu, organize and share the knowledge on how the virus changes, because the virus, as every virus, it mutates, and they share the knowledge on how it's changing from different parts of the world and collaboratively develop the new, the, the, the variations of the vaccines that then will be administered or delivered around the world. So the one thing that I would do directly, and this is just because of where I am, I work as an academic, so I would promote more um, specific networks that operate on a common knowledge basis. Great. Let's move on with you, Ila, maybe? Post-capitalism, how did we get there? <laughs> yeah. if, if, I, if I had the chance, I would, I would federate uh, big tech. I mean, uh, expropriation, I also think, is super interesting. And the first step could be proper taxation, as you also proposed. So I think that would go along with my model of federation. And with federation, I mean breaking up big tech in smaller regional proportions and making sure that uh, those regional bodies will be um, administered and steered by local committees of a really broad and diverse set of stakeholders that are connected to municipalities and to public infrastructure. Because uh, we have not enough talked about the fact that a lot of what big tech is producing or gets as a by-result of their, of their production is, of course, data. And but it's also the impact on our public infrastructure, looking at the effect of Airbnb on gentrification in cities or looking at the impact of, um, of transport uh, jams, traffic jams generated by transport of Amazon, etc. So I think a lot of what we see here is touching down on public infrastructure. So ideally, we would have in those federated regional chapters of big tech, we would have experts who would look at all those side effects and try to address that. And ideally, not by even more uh, uh, complicated policies, but by local firms and companies that can help with, for instance, the last mile of transporting uh, um, boxes from A to B, that could be done by a platform co-op that is based in a specific region or city. So in order to really connect the regional economy to the work of big tech, that would be something that I would, uh, in fact, love to work on. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. So we, have, we had expropriation, we had federation, and now we're looking again to you, Max. Where do you stand on this issue? Uh, first of all, let me say my vision for tomorrow uh, would be a lively democracy where many voices have a say, right? And in that way, I would say, stands monopoly power. Monopoly power of big tech, but also of other corporations. And getting a step further with uh, a democratic digitalization means breaking up this power. And I think this it's feasible, actually. Other, uh, I wouldn't say... Uh, that taxation is very feasible. Stronger taxation of big tech is not that feasible in Europe at the moment, especially uh, with the, the current German government, but also with potential future governments. I don't see a lot uh, happening on global taxation of big tech. Um, that's why I would argue a renewal of competition po policy and breaking up big tech is what I would do uh, next. And I think, uh, really, the, the, the atmosphere in European society is, uh, is uh, in a way, also among policymakers, that we can uh, uh, make steps forward in breaking up these companies. And, of course, that's not the end of the story, right? But it's a first important step um, 
because I uh, think that this power concentration in our economy and society is not sustainable and not uh, yeah not uh, in line with a democratic society. Okay, great. Thanks so much um, for that. So I feel there's uh, there's one interesting uh, small tension in here which I would like to like to tease out a little bit more, and I think that is that is really the question of well. What role can competition law play? Can it play a role? And, and how powerful is that as a tool? And I think we have we had two uh, quite different perspectives on that. So, Max, you just you just presented the, your vision for tomorrow. It would involve breaking up. And and Cecilia, we've we've heard from you that that you are more skeptical about the the potentials of breaking up. Maybe we can we can tease it out a little bit. Why are you more skeptical than Max about about this idea of breaking up tech? So, the first and easiest way to put it would just be it will not happen, because it, because it will not happen. Uh, the US and the Chinese state will never go for that alternative. But let's say they do. What will happen afterwards? On the one side, pretty much what's already happening. Alibaba is not one company. Alibaba is many companies. And this, although it's not that simple to see, because with Alibaba we see it is Alibaba and Group, Ali Health, is the same for every multinational corporation in the world. They are actually a tree of multiple companies. So what we actually have is companies that are kind of a, an analytic fiction. The multinational corporation doesn't exist from the legal perspective. And they still share, they still exchange knowledge between the different legal entities. Not only between different legal entities. The, among the top 10 most frequent co-authors of Microsoft, you have Google and Amazon. Of Amazon, you have Microsoft. Of Google, you have Microsoft and Amazon. So these companies are also sharing portions of knowledge between them, although they still establish technological competition. So if the basis of their power is the data and the knowledge they are constantly appropriating, and they're still sharing it among themselves, and they can still do it if we break them up, even if we break them up, they will still be as powerful as they are now. On top of that, if we try to just promote more competition, we will always have this problem. I do believe that we can provide or, or have cooperatives that operate as platforms for specific things, but I'm sorry to say that there will never be a cooperative that will be in charge of the cloud and every single digital company and every company and every state and every university will rely on the cloud. And the best cloud that exists is big tech cloud. That doesn't mean that they did it. It just means that they appropriated knowledge and data to do it. And they keep doing it. And it's basically because of how the algorithms work. More data they process, the better they get. So if we break them up, we will also be losing efficiencies. So that's why for me, the solution is to reappropriate because it was already taken from society at large. So it's the only real, real solution. The, the one that underlies everything is to get all that back. We all May saw, I yeah, yeah I, I, I very much think that you can say something. We all saw you uh, uh, vehemently disagreeing, which is nice. That's how it should be. So uh, yeah. there were two points that were raised. The one is, will it happen? And what would it look like if it happened? So I, I saw you disagreeing with the first one, but maybe take both of them. Like, uh, why, 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 why will it happen, Max? Just, just as to ask before, Ila, did you want to raise something on it? I can answer, I can go step in later. No, no, but go ahead, yeah. it's fine, no problem. Okay, so theoretically, it's possible to break up Amazon as a corporation. Uh, theoretically, that's entirely possible, right? So even the Bundeskartellamt could do that, the German Competition Authority. DG Competition on the EU level could do that in theory. You could tighten competition law and... Uh, enable the competition authority to do this more effectively and to have more reason to do so. And I think there are many reasons. Um, but coming back to the cloud, as you were mentioning this, uh, Cecilia, why not break up Amazon? If you separate Amazon Web Services, the retail division, the marketplace, and the logistic units from, each, from one another, we are already a step further because it means that 
uh, these companies cannot can no longer uh, uh, put the profits uh, share the profits uh, between them and yeah uh, destroy other businesses and uh, that would also already be a big step forward so fair enough to keep the cloud as one company and maybe it's the most efficient one and you need to yeah socialize it or expropriate it uh, expropriate it but uh, to separate this this uh, amazon company would be a big step forward response from you afterwards, but first I would like to uh, take in Ela because um, Cecilia also um, mentioned specifically the idea of building alternatives and, and the potentiality of uh, organizing the cloud in a cooperative fashion, and you were skeptical about that. How do you feel about that with your experience in the, in the field of alternative platforms? Can they, can, they, can they own the cloud? Can they build the cloud? Or if not, what are they strong at? What are their biggest strengths? Yeah, of course. I mean, if we discuss now building a real alternative to uh, Amazon cloud services, uh, I would completely agree. I can't see any uh, platform co-op, any company out there that could outcompete what they have built up. But uh, we're discussing here on a super high level, and I would, I would opt for a little bit more nuances in this whole discussion, because it is not just the cloud uh, raining absolutely on each and everything, but let's look into other uh, um, pockets of economy. And there I think, uh, yes, it is possible to come up with alternative infrastructures. And I guess it's a little bit, I would also argue for a change of perspective, because I, it's true, we, we are going to lose efficiency, right? But uh, efficiency is not the only viewpoint we should apply in this discussion, because looking at the current state of things, uh, where we are at globally. You know, like, look at all those multiple crises. I think there's a, uh, from our position here in the West, we might argue for efficiency, but there's also many other positions we can take into consideration and should take into consideration, because, the insta for instance, there might be groups uh, um, on a global scale that absolutely have to rely on uh, security networks uh, outside of Amazon that uh, are in desperate need of building their own cloud services which might work and operate on a regional level and they have really good reasons to do so because they live in political system that, uh, that do not allow them to, to uh, uh, rely on systems like, like Amazon. So I think um, the difficulty here, the complexity is that we have to address so many different questions all at once. We have to look at the global perspective, and then we have to look into the regions, into various markets. And what I would really strongly prefer is looking at the perspective of people's needs. And I think this is a factor we should not take out of the debate, because it's true that uh, in many aspects it seems as, we, as, we are, as if we are doomed, right? But, um, but maybe it's still possible to create networks on a regional basis uh, or, let's say, on a European basis that cater for economic circles where people really can get in transaction with each other. And a lot of the stuff, uh, for instance, uh, retail, delivery, etc., that many people choose to, um, to get from Amazon can be catered for by other means. I think there is still flexibility. There is still a possibility to not use the services wherever we can, uh, I'm not saying that um, it's possible to uh, entirely neglect them because it's, I think it's, it's true that for a lot of the stuff we need on a daily basis, we have Amazon in between, even though we, we don't even know about it. We think we buy the books from our local dealer and they order at Amazon, right? So we know about all these complexities. Um, but to me, I would really argue to, I would like to break down the debate and uh, and look into specific potentialities of where those, um, yeah, corporations, this, if it's platform co-ops, whatever, can really make sense. Perfect. Let's do that. Let's let's break it down and uh, try to put it into smaller pieces. Maybe uh, I mean, 
we, we will do that, but at the same time, we try to move beyond capitalism, so we juggle both things uh, at the same time. But maybe if we want to focus, as you said, on people's needs and trying to understand what do people need, and, and we try to take this perspective, then from the capitalist point of view, we would also need to ask ourselves, well, well who then is the, is the revolutionary subject that will initiate that transition? What are the needs of this uh, revolutionary subject that could potentially move us beyond what you consider to be intellectual monopoly capitalism. So maybe, maybe Cecilia, maybe you can, you can give us a little bit of an understanding. I mean, traditionally we would always say, well, it's, it's capital and it's labor, and that's the antagonism that is structuring capitalism. Is that changing intellectual monopoly capitalism? And who is the subject that needs to push for this uh, transformation? Okay, so the first part I will emphasize, also because I work with colleagues that speak of techno-feudalism, for instance, and I need to emphasize that this is capitalism. The fact that we add the intellectual monopoly to, the, to how we label it is just to emphasize on, on the changes and the evolution. Capitalism is a way of producing that is constantly evolving and changing itself, and we should be at the frontier in trying to rethink, for instance, of the political subject with these transformations at hand and reflecting on these transformations. So. I think we need to move beyond capitalism, which at the same time nowadays means moving beyond intellectual monopoly capitalism. But it's not just neoliberalism, I think we need to move beyond capitalism. And to do it, of course, uh, it's not simple, and I've been reflecting on this for many, many years, but I would say about the question of the subject, that there is no, that is not a subject but a diversity and plurality of subjects. And I think that we need to try to work on combining, reinforcing, and potentiating all the different fights. And a way to, like, to quickly think about it is think about gender and, and the patriarchal society we live in. We need to also think about the ecological disasters. We need to think about the appropriation of knowledge and, and the appropriation of data. We also need to think about the typical ways of reflecting on capital and labor dynamics. So we need unions as much as we need to think of alternative ways of organizing grassroots movements, cooperatives that share knowledge and share between each other and that try to produce in different ways. I don't think there is one subject actually, but multiple, and we still need to be creating enough to create new ways of organizing from, yeah, together beyond the, what we already have at hand. Thank you. I would like to propose a similar question to you, Ila, but with a slight uh, twist, and that is the, um, when you speak about platform corps, what I always find, find curious about this notion is that um, on one hand, um, these individuals who do that, they want to go against platform capitalism, they want to position themselves in opposition to that, but um, they use the, the market form in order to fight against big tech, but they're nevertheless building markets themselves. So, so when we think about these subjects who are building these alternative platforms using the market tool in order to potentially move us beyond capitalism, I would like to, to hear maybe your take on this. Is it possible to, to employ market structures to move us beyond the current configuration of big tech, or is it, is it inherently doomed to fail? Yeah, I, I guess the fact that most of these uh, platform co-ops are really struggling uh, in financially, uh, that already speaks to what you suggest, right? But I, I think it has to be a combination of things, and uh, I, I fully agree when you say we have a, we have a um, multiplicity, a plurality of subjects. But the chance is, uh, actually, if platform co-ops, for instance, or other kinds of organizations that really try to uh, conquer big tech within a certain market, I think their chance could be to introduce a new subject that we don't know of yet, and that hardly does not exist anywhere. And that could be uh, um, new stakeholder groups, as I proposed before, commons public partnerships, or other forms where uh, stakeholders get together that, that normally do not define markets. Um, but for instance, just, just to give a brief example, um, so fair b and b what they are doing basically is to offer short-term rentals, just as Airbnb does, but they are organized as a cooperative, and they have um, 
local, a local board within the co-op, so there's municipalities involved, uh, city councils, people from the neighborhood, etc., etc. So what they're doing is to introduce a new stakeholder group, a new subject, if, if you want, that becomes more visible because there are more people united there coming from their own respective communities and backgrounds, but uniting into one subject. And I think in order to succeed on the market, and even if it's an alternative market, there has to be more to it than just putting a product out there. Uh, it's really, it's a combination of effective communication. It's introducing new stakeholder groups that have the capacity and power to build infrastructure. It is, and that is the biggest challenge so far, coming up with a product that is attractive enough for people to really you know, make them want to use it because, to be very honest, a lot of these products compared to, uh, you know, to, I, I don't know, uh, uh, the, the outlets of big techs, they have a hard time to deliver as much as, as, as these products do. So there's still a lot of work to do, but I would definitely say it's a dream to think that it's enough to put out whatever on the market and you will succeed I don't think it's possible. There has to be much more. And ultimately, I think it's also a matter of the storytelling connected to, to this effort, to this work, because it's also about enhancing people's imagination that it makes sense to, to support that, right? So it's quite complex, I guess. Okay, before we open up to the, uh, to the film and to get your perspectives in, just, um, one last time, giving it to you, Max. Similar question, also the question of, of um, who is the subject that can potentially achieve this transformation? And for you specifically, you were, you were pointed towards the need for, for breaking up. What I'm asking myself is, well, you also characterize big tech as being immensely powerful on the European level, influencing the DSA, etc. Well, who then could be the actor, the group, the network? What kind of group and actor network do we need to break up these monopoles? Do we have this group, this network already, or does it need to be built? Well, I would agree with Cecilia uh, on the question, who is the subject? We need a multiplicity of subjects. And uh, if I come, may come back to the case of Amazon, because I've been haunted by this also for a couple of months, uh, thinking about this. Uh, Amazon is a company where you have many people uh, who are not really happy with the way it's, uh, things are going, right? And... We, you have uh, trade unions, you have um, uh, uh, digital data protection organizations, you have uh, environmental organizations or people who think about uh, climate policy and many are affected by what Amazon and its monopoly power are doing. And uh, I think only the multiplicity of... Uh, those challenging the power uh, can can win this fight, and uh, I would argue it's it's really time in Europe to 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 build up an anti-monopoly movement that challenges monopoly power and goes uh, beyond the yeah the the economy that we have uh, at the moment, which is very much dominated by large-scale companies that also dominate decision-making. We really need to go beyond that. Okay, great. Um, now I would like to open the discussion to, to all of you, and uh, we have, uh, we will, we will um, collect a couple of questions, I think three max to the audience. I see one person in the back, uh, before, b before you start speaking, just like uh, trying to see a couple more hands, so I can, I can, anybody else who wants to, who wants to speak? Okay, one, two, Three there. Okay, so we start with you at the very top. Yeah, thank you. The, the, can I ask two questions? The first is very quick. Do you really believe that the politics, that our governments are a channel that will lead this transition? Um, do you think they are prepared for this institutionally? And my second kind of inspiration is that when I saw you standing there, Ela, and saying we need more intercooperation, I absolutely agree. We need it, and we 
I think, share this with a lot of people since a long time, that this is kind of the path to go. So I was wondering, why don't we call for a conference which is focused exclusively on intercooperation among us, and every single session is designed to sign a contract among the members who are there to create a new intercooperation, because it's just not happening, and it's the path we need to take. Thanks. Okay, is politics an actor that can do these changes, and why don't we cooperate more concretely in a separate conference? Okay, we will take the second question here on the, on the left side from my perspective. Oh, the third question, sorry. Um, yeah, I actually also have two kind of um, like notion questions, or I didn't understand what exactly you were referring to partially. Um, so the one of them is, what is the cloud that you kept mentioning? And the other one is, what are platform cooperatives compared to just cooperatives, or what, yeah. So maybe, maybe it was clear for everyone, but um, yeah, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then we'll take uh, the, the final question for this round here. Oh, sorry, I'll chase you all through the room. You have to walk all the way over here, and uh, the question is, is over there. And then we will give it to the, to the plenary. Do any of you think the European dependency on those big tech companies has to be resolved before we can take action against them? Or do you think it's part of the process? Did you? No, I, no, I didn't get the last part. Can you can The you dependence of the EU on these companies depends on what? Yes, also? so the EU depends on the cloud that is provided yeah. by the American companies, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think it is part of the process of building platform alternatives or federating or annihilating those companies? or breaking them up, or as you said. Um, do you think we need to become independent from their cloud services before we do that, or can we do it in the process? Perfect, now we got you. The problem was we didn't hear the microphone on stage. Now we do, everything is crystal clear. Okay, we have a, a, a set of questions. Um, I'll just, uh, let's start with you, Cecilia. Pick out the questions that you feel most emboldened to answer. Okay, so about politics. Part of what I was trying to show is that core states are to some extent aligned with these companies. And even if they battle against them, it's not because they are trying to defend the people in general. That doesn't mean that states in general cannot play a role. I think they can, and they are still a sphere where we can try to push them to do so, but it will definitely need grassroots movements, organizations that are and, and not only to push the state, but also to build alternatives at the same time. So that to the first question. Thank you very much for asking what the cloud is, because I actually think that perhaps many of you haven't heard of that before. The way, so usually companies and individuals used to just have everything in their computers. So if I was using Microsoft Office, I would typically have a CD, for instance, just installed in my, and installed that in my computer. I would have all my data in my computer. What happened around 15, 20 years ago was that a technology was developed that enables all this to be separated from my specific computer. And I'm speaking from an individual perspective, but you can also think in terms of an organization, so a company or the state. So instead of having the software installed in the computer, now we have apps, which means that we have things operating through our computers, but they are always connected to the internet. And actually, we don't own them. What we do is we loan them. We rent access to Microsoft Office, for instance. Not only access to Microsoft Office, we also rent access to their servers to store our data there. And what companies do, think for instance of Uber or Netflix or Siemens, so I'm speaking about other large companies, big pharma, what they do? They move their operations to the cloud. 
which means that they no longer have the data in their own data centers, in their offices and buildings, but in the data centers owned by, let's say, Google or Amazon or Microsoft. They use the services provided by these companies to analyze the data. So they use the algorithms provided by these companies. Of course, Uber or Netflix will also have developers that are complementing the provided services to make them specific to fulfill the needs of Netflix or Uber. But they will still rely on them. Think of Uber. Uber works with Google Maps. If it's not Google Maps, it's Waze. Both belong to Google. It uses Amazon Web Services as its cloud business. Therefore, all the data goes to the cloud and is processed by it. So there is also a hierarchy of platforms. It's not the same to be Uber than to be Google or to be Amazon. That's why big tech also are so important, and that's why the cloud is so important. It's the infrastructure that underlies all the platforms. And this is also why it's quite impossible to live without them. There is a very interesting New York Times article where a journalist tried to live without big tech for, I think, a month, and she failed. Because there are so many things that rely on these companies that just by saying, I will not consume this, will not work. And then the final question was more about what is, is there an alternative for the European Union? If they pursue a policy like the ill-equipped, I'm sorry, and you can reply afterwards, as the ill-equipped Digital Markets Act, no. The Digital Markets Act is only looking at these companies as market gatekeepers, and they are knowledge and data gatekeepers. But the EU, I think, that is not really willing to regulate these companies as intellectual monopolies, because although the EU, the European Union doesn't have big tech intellectual monopolies, it does have big pharma as intellectual monopolies. It has Siemens here in this country, among many other companies that operate as intellectual monopolies. So, as far as I know, the EU is actually thinking of its cloud as to some extent relying on these companies, and it cannot escape from that. Could it do it? It needs to invest a lot in one digital infrastructure, two, a lot of AI algorithms and wait and put all the data there. I don't see it quite feasible. I don't say that it's impossible, but I do think that it would involve a huge pol like political commitment that I don't see the EU really wanting to pursue. Max, do you want to chime in and uh, respond to some of these questions? Yeah. But, um, Cecilia, I have to admit that uh, I don't have any counter-argument in, in this case. I, I don't want to counter-argue here in this case. I, but, but I want to, would want to uh, answer one of the questions that came from, from the audience, where I feel entitled to say something about I, I think uh, there is a certain political will uh, to, to challenge the power of big tech, um, the Digital Markets Act was a first step to do this, even though it cha uh, challenges only its market power, I agree, but uh, the data protection issues, they are, for instance, I mean, one major problem the US is it, it doesn't enforce its rules, for instance, uh, the, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Directive, is not properly enforced, otherwise we would be in a different situation. Um, but my main point is actually, uh, without social movements, I think policymakers won't won't really uh, make big steps. So I think the the pressure from social movements and actually transatlantic social movements, for instance, challenging the power of Amazon, I like to repeat this, um, would be very fruitful, and it would be wise to work for transatlantic movements. Even global movements would be better, but. Uh, I see a certain chance to, to make steps forwards um, in creating alternatives, in challenging the power of big tech, in, in uh, creating a more democratic global society overall. Even though we can't see that at the moment, I, uh, I would uh, share the hope also with others uh, that it's, it's, it's time to act now. Thank you, Max. Um, and Ila, uh, 
you would uh, be the last person to answer these, uh, this round of questions and you would also have the final words of this panel. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, then I would start by answering your question. Thanks for asking what are platform co-ops. So basically, um, platform co-ops are, it can be cooperatives, but do not necessarily have to be cooperatives. It can be other organizations that are organized a set, around a set of rules or bylaws and that are commonly governed, let's say. Um, so, Platform Co-op um, is, is organized around a digital service, it can be a marketplace or a, dig a software or whatever, and it's very often the workers of that cooperative who organize around that software, around the digital market, whatever, um, and in doing so, they address a different group of consumers, they try to enter and compete on the same market, as you just uh, mentioned. And ultimately what they want to provide is an alternative to the monopolies of the market economy. And this is also what we have discussed, that it's of course, uh, it's really the David and Goliath uh, um, perspective that you can put on here. But that's basically platform cooperativism. It's building an alternative based on a cooperative form. And um, I would like to, uh, to just address the inter-cooperation question. And inter-cooperation, for those who wonder what it means, is nothing else than incentivizing organizations to work with other cooperative organizations rather than, um, yeah, than, than getting services from a market monopoly. And this is a political question then, and that maybe is an indirect answer to, to your question around is, is politics, is that actually the arena to bring about that change? It might be interesting to discuss if there would be incentives for uh, platform co-ops or other alternative uh, uh, economies to really incentivize intercooperation in such a manner that there would be tax reliefs or there would be uh, any forms of rewards for organization working with each other and in doing so establishing an infrastructure that can help maybe breaking the power of big tech one day and that would be a really interesting incentive i guess uh, about europe uh, and the endeavor to build like independence i think europe is, is really thinking about that since quite a number of years there has been projects like gaia x and they have not been really successful, and this also brings me to thinking about whether this whole discussion around Europe being like completely independent, building its own thing, there's a, a number of problems with that. It's first of all, it's the stakeholders that have been discussed or that have been involved in that project, I find have not been, uh, what I said before, like a really novel, super diverse group. The whole the whole framework of how this project started is a very traditional framework. I would also like to question the, the, the European uh, reference at all. How useful is it to discuss such a question uh, um, you know, with, a, with a European reference? Who can actually, who can refer to it? But that's a, it's a different question. But so far, I think we do not have any example of uh, Europe creating their own data structure, their own data infrastructure. And very often Europeans tend to say, yeah, but we have our own values, we have our own long history of values. And I find that also a bit um, strange because I don't think uh, that Europe has a uh, really exceptional set of values uh, um, in opposite to United States or uh, other countries, to be very honest, uh, and I could give a lot of reasons for that, but I'm not going to do that now. And yeah, what else? I have the feeling I should say something very clever now, if I have the... You already did, you already If did. I have the last word, but <laughs> I, I, maybe we leave it at that. Perfect, thank you so much. Um,
we didn't agree on, on every single thing on this panel, expropriating, breaking up, etc. We also didn't come up with a, with a blueprint for moving beyond capitalism. Maybe that was that we aimed a bit too high, but I do think that we have figured out uh, a lot of interesting things that, that are shared across uh, the panelists here. Uh, for example, the need for tr a transnational movement that initiates um, a greater resistance. We have also agreed that there is not one revolutionary subject that can make us move beyond intellectual monopoly capitalism, but that there are actually uh, many diverse subjects. So I think uh, we've uh, found some common ground here, which is important to move this debate further. So thank you so much to Max for being with us online. Thank you so much to Cecilia. Thanks. Thank you so much to Ella. And thanks to all of you. And we hope you stick around for the, for the wrap-up of the conference and then also, of course, for the party later on. So hopefully see you there and uh, thanks a lot again.